So in the next couple of videos, I'll be discussing the details of how procedure calls are handled in the MIPS architecture. Let's start by looking at the memory layout that we had discussed before. So we had said that at the bottom you have your code, then you have your global variables, then you have your heap, which is dynamically allocated data structures, which starts at the end of the global region and grows upwards. And then you have the stack, which starts at the top and grows downwards, right? So the stack is basically where every procedure is going to allocate some memory to keep track of a few things. And then we'll soon talk about what those few things are. So essentially, if procedure a, let's say that's the very first procedure that you execute, and this itself goes ahead and calls procedure B. And then procedure B goes on to call procedure C, right? If this is what happens, then your stack is going to look like this. Initially, there's nothing on the stack. And then when, when procedure A is invoked, it starts creating a few data elements over here, right? So all the, all the local variables of procedure A, right? So if procedure A declares integer small a, then small a gets placed on the stack. And then when you call procedure B, the stack grows. It now accommodates the variables that, that are declared inside procedure B and that are local to procedure B. So procedure B may have declared a variable integer x. So x gets placed on the stack. Then when you call procedure C, again, the stack grows in size and procedure C may have declared variable y, so y gets placed on the stack, and so on. In addition to these local variables, there are a few other things that are placed on the stack, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Now, once procedure C finishes, it's, it's going to deallocate the variables that it had created on the stack, so this stuff goes away. And you're back in procedure B, where you have access to the variables declared by procedure B, right? So X is, again, going to be accessible. Once procedure B finishes, this gets deallocated from the stack, and you move back up again. Okay, a couple more things to point out. At any given point of time, a procedure which allocates a certain region of memory on the stack is referred to as that procedure's activation record. And the frame pointer has an address which indicates the start of that activation record, and the stack pointer has the address of of the end address of that activation record, right? So these are special registers in MIPS $FP, $SP, which keep track of the start and end of any procedure's activation record. When procedure A is calling procedure B, you know, that's it's usually called with a few arguments, okay? And so those arguments are placed in special registers. So procedure A is going to make sure that $A0, A1, until A3, are populated with the arguments that procedure A wants to provide for procedure B. Okay, so in this example, procedure A is referred to as the caller, and procedure B is referred to as the callee. So the caller is supposed to make sure that the arguments for the callee are placed beforehand into special registers A0 through A3. When procedure B returns, right, so at the end over here, procedure B is going to be returning and it might be returning some value, let's say, x, right? The, the value that was computed within procedure B is finally returned to procedure A. The way this is handled in MIPS is procedure B has to put that result into special register v0 or v1, and then it returns. So when procedure A gets control back, it can find the result of the previous procedure in the special register v0. Okay, so this is kind of how procedures operate. You put arguments into registers A0 to A3. You invoke the procedure. That procedure then creates some more room for itself on the stack, which is referred to as its activation record. This is where it's going to save its local variables and a few other elements. And once that procedure is done, it puts its result into special registers V0 or V1 and then hands control back to procedure A. Now, how exactly is the procedure being invoked? This is done with a special instruction referred to as a jump and link. So procedure A is going to do jump and link, and it's going to give a certain label. So let's just call that label 
B start. So procedure B is going to start at a given address over here, which has a label B start, and you know here are the instructions that correspond to procedure B. So procedure A is going to do jump and link B start, which tells the hardware that this is a procedure call. So so transfer control to B start, and at the end of B start, there's going to be a return instruction. I'm going to expand on what the return instruction looks like in a second, but there'll be a return instruction which should bring control back to where procedure A left off. Okay, so how do I handle that, right? Because in the code for B, B has no idea where it got invoked from, right? So B could have been called from a variety of different procedures, right? So the code for B somehow has to know where it has to return to, okay? And so the role of the jump and link is to kind of facilitate that return back from procedure B. So let me explain how that happens. So the program counter is a special register in hardware which tells you where in the program you are. It has the address of the instruction that you're executing. So if you're executing instruction number or the instruction at address 760, then the program counter has this value 760 saying that I'm currently executing the instruction at address 760. After that instruction is executed, I'm going to move on to the next instruction. That next instruction is going to have address 764 because every instruction is four bytes long. And so the, the program counter essentially keeps incrementing itself by four, except when you're supposed to transfer control and move to a different instruction altogether, right? At that point, the program counter gets changed with the address that you're moving to. Okay, so let me again explain what happens on a jump and link. So on a jump and link, I know that at some point I have to return back to this next instruction, which is 764. Okay, so what a jump and link does is it transfers control to B start. Okay, and there's a special register in, um, in the register file referred to as the return address. And the return address is populated with the instruction I should be returning back to. So this is going to have the value 764. So jump and link is going to say, well, you know, B start may have an address 1064, let's say. So when you execute a jump and link, what happens is that the contents of PC get transferred to $RA after incrementing by four. And then the PC gets set to the place that you're jumping to. So the PC now becomes 1064. So then you start executing these instructions. So the next instruction to execute would be instruction at 1064, 1068, so on. And then when you're supposed to return, how do I know where to return? Well, that, that address has been stored in register $RA. So this return instruction would take the form JR $RA, right? So JR is an instruction that says jump to whatever address is specified in the following register. And so $RA says 764. So once this instruction is executed, the PC is set to 764. And the next instruction I execute is the one right after the jump and link, right? So the jump and link executes, you transfer control here, you execute the sequence of instructions, and then you return back over here, right? And the whole reason we had to do this is because procedure B could have been called from a variety of places. So the compiler does not know beforehand where I should return to. Okay, so at runtime, by executing the jump and link, you keep track of where you should be returning to. And so this instruction um, transfers control back to the instruction right after the procedure call. So I think now you know most of the elements involved in handling a procedure call. So now let's walk through the next few slides, which, which actually spell out all of these details. So this slide kind of summarizes what I said at the start. So when you're initiating a new procedure, you have to pass arguments. This is done through registers A0 to A3. Then you transfer control to the callee. This is with the jump and link instruction. Then the callee may grow the stack to allocate resources for its local variables and other things that need to get saved in memory. So this is you know moving the stack pointer, moving the frame pointer, then you execute the procedure. When you're done, you place your results where the caller can access it, which we said is in registers V0 and V1. And then you return control back to the caller, and this is by doing jump to the address already saved in the return address register. Okay, so now that we've introduced all these registers, you know, let me just do a quick summary of what these registers are, right? So we said that there are 32 MIPS registers 
here's a rundown of what each of those registers does. So register 0 is a special register that always has the value 0. Register 1, which I've not mentioned over here, so register 1 is a special register which is only accessible to the assembler. Okay, So as a programmer, as, as someone who writes assembly programs, you are never going to use register 1. Then there are registers 2 and 3, which we said are the return values, registers 4 to 7, which are the arguments to a procedure. I'll get to these in a second. Then we talked about the global pointer, which points to the global region, that is variables that are accessible to every single procedure. Then the stack pointer and the frame pointer that keep track of the start and end of a procedure's activation record and then the return address register, which helps you return back from a procedure call. Now let's talk about these registers here, which we've already seen in, in our many examples, right? So there are essentially 10 temporary registers, so T0 through T9, and then there are S0 through S7, which are considered to be more valuable registers, which correspond to variables that the programmer may have defined. Okay, and as we walk through examples of these procedures, you'll see when to use T0, T0 through T9 and when to use S0 through S7. At an intuitive level, T0 through T9 are scratch pad registers which have short lifetimes. That means I allocate that register, I put something in it, I consume it right away, and then I don't care about that register anymore. Okay, whereas S0 through S7 may be a little bit more long-lived where the value of some variable defined by the programmer might be sitting in that, and I want that value to stay resident in that register for a fairly large amount of time, even across procedure calls. Okay, so we will get to more details uh, as we go through examples.